All right, it is 3.30. We will bring the July 12th public safety meeting to order. I am here, Council Member Fullerton and Council Member Baldwin are here. With that, we'll go into East Pierce Fire and Rescue Monthly Report, Deputy Chief Mack. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am reporting here because Chief Arkinson is on vacation. I'll be giving the report by all means asking questions. You already have a copy of most of our information in the packet. Um, referring to page three, um, incident count, and I'll just really talk about obviously Bonnie Lake Station 111. Um, you can see that the call volume um, may seem like it has a little bit of a dip of a 6.3%. We went from uh, approximately 1,200 calls there in 2021. This year, uh, June, did, our numbers now currently are about 1,139 uh, calls. Um, even though that may seem like a decrease, but if you remember last year in June, our weather was considerably different than it was, and a lot of our calls are weather dependent. So when we talk about wildfires, remember towards the you know, first part of end of June, first part of June last year, we were hitting those 100 degree temperatures, which increased EMS calls, <clears throat> which increased fire calls. So even though that may seem down, it's actually right on par for what we would have. If we uh, compare it to the other other stations, you can see that they are obviously a very busy station for us. Um, if you kind of refer to page four, um, average response times, you can see that the city of Bonnie Lake um, has a very acceptable response time. The two numbers there, one being the actual average response time year to date, that's about six minutes and 12 seconds. And then what we call the 90 percentile uh, number, which is taking out kind of outliers, the long calls, the short calls, the ones where a person happens to on view a call or the ones that they don't put themselves in route or there's a data error. Uh, we kind of remove those and go to the 90 percentile, which is kind of an industry standard. You can see City of Bonnie Lakes right in par uh, with everybody else. Um, and then going back to kind of what I was mentioning about calls, we are right on uh, target. In fact, we have an increase in our five-year trend of calls with already year-to-date about 14,000 calls, which is a 13% actual call volume. Um, and that increase is still kind of scarred by our COVID numbers, which we took a decrease in call volumes over the COVID years. Understandably, people staying home are being encouraged to stay um, and not call 911. And then we are we're seeing, as we slide out of COVID, um, we are seeing an uptick in call volume. That's evidence and overall call. Um, page five. Uh, and uh, image seven, you can see that the busiest engine company you have is right here next door to you. You probably hear their sirens throughout the day uh, going on calls. Uh, so far this year, they're about uh, 1,559 uh, calls. Their medic unit that's housed there is Medic 111. They also are the busiest medic unit. Um, and obviously some of it is, is general location. They're really centrally located to this portion of the district. If you think about the way our district is divided into kind of two hills there, Milton and Edgewood. I'm going to read. And so they're kind of centrally located. So they, they, but these are first out calls. These are calls that are generated in their area. Um, the rest of this, a uh, few of these may or may not be uh, interesting. I know that the figures are pretty small, at least for my eyes. So if, you need, if there's any questions on them, I can refer to them. These are basically mutual aid that's been given to us or that, that we have received or that we have given uh, to our neighboring jurisdiction. These are just outlining some of the call types that we uh, responded on and then some of the ones that we have received. Um, Obviously, even though we're a big district, we do rely on some of our bordering uh, agencies to, to handle some of our uh, calls that we may not be able to handle all of, or if we're second out, for example, uh, if engine 118 up in the Edgewood area is out on a call already, a call will come in. These are representative of those type of calls. Uh, figure 12 on the next page, page seven in your packet. Talk about transports, uh, kind of an interesting fact, which most of you probably already know. Uh, quite a few of our own transports, we all do we transport um, all of our EMS calls with our medic units. That's when you hear about what a medic is. So obviously, to provide the advanced service, uh, medical services, but also to provide transports. And then I know the question that happens in the July meetings is what happened with fireworks, right? <laughs> so um, down in figure seven or 13, you can see that we did a uh, uh, calls, there really were only, there, our call volume for fireworks related calls this year were down 
I think part of it was due to location of the holiday being on a Monday, kind of spread out uh, fireworks with some of the work that's been done politically by our cities um, and the county on fireworks restrictions. Um, and I think also, to be honest, the weather helped, right? I mean, we know that uh, days before we had considerable rain um, and good, good for us weather when it comes to the 4th of July. Um, and it actually worked out perfect because we did end up with a dry pour. Um, um, and so our call, our calls from 4th of July related incidents were actually uh, down this year from, from years. Congratulations to all of us mm -hmm. who made yes. an uh, impact in the little ways that we do. And your date range on that is uh, June 25th of 2022. It's, this isn't a 22 year span, right? No, no. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that should say 2022. Okay. That's, I'm like, wow, that's really, yeah. I mean, yeah. 22, that's only, 22 years are only six tall. <laughs> yeah, that's great. They deal with fireworks, right? <laughs> Well, they take the day off. Yeah, they take the day off. Um, and then there's a last figure in there about the Holly. Always kind of interesting to this, to this um, the number of call, calls that we're going. We know that this is just a small snapshot. If we were to look back about a year ago, um, our calls have almost doubled into that area. Um, and obviously, we're starting on building a fire station. Um, with that, I have a few items I just report will we'll report on. Um, one of them being uh, Station 111. Uh, currently, as we speak, I think at 2:45 they started. They opened up bids uh, for Station 111, so we're through the process of of getting our uh, permits all done, and they've opened it up for bids. It's been, um, I believe, posted for about three weeks, and now today is the day that the actual bids will be open. So we'll probably We'll spend the next 30 days looking at kind of reviewing the bids, making sure that we're able, the contractors are able to meet their obligations during review of the contractors and then awarding a bid. Uh, but by this time next month, we'll be actually awarding a bid. Um, hopefully shovels in the ground about 30 days after that. So sometime in the September, October, or August uh, time frame will break ground. And I believe that contract is about 300 over a year. Uh, should be the timeline barring that we can get steel and some of the other things that have stalled us on a few projects in the past. But that's good news. I mean, that piece of property has been sitting there and we've been working on that for quite a while. So this is the next <clears> step uh, is being is happening right, right now. So there'll be more noise in this building here soon. He's been taking measurements next to it. <laughs> He's already moved all the chief, Paul Chief Parkinson was gone on vacation. He's already moved all his stuff out of his office and put my stuff up on the wall. Uh, for curtains. <laughs> for curtains um, we're in the process right now working on our 2023 um, implications to our budget. Or the other part of our update is that we're going to do for our uh, sale of our bonds. Remember our capital facilities bonds. We uh, sold you know, uh, half of them, about $40 million uh, dollar portion of them. Um, and now we're going out to sell the second half of those bonds, and those bonds will be for, you know, Station 111, Station 117, the power station, and then the remodel. The next closest would be 114 and the 12, which is the one that's on the 100. Have over in the Prairie Ridge area. Do the higher interest rates affect your bonding potential on that? Um, they will have <laughs> some some effect, but what we are we've been working with a bond agent. We actually were trying to get a re-rate. City of Miami planning and come there, work on our re-rating. Um, unfortunately, we were not higher. We want we didn't get our rating higher. We're um, A plus. Uh, we're trying to get double A plus uh, rating, but we were kept at the same level as we've always been, which is really good. We have a very good bond rating. Um, and I don't know, to be honest, what the interest rates uh, landed on. They were working on. Okay. So. Um, and that, unless there's questions, we'll conclude this. I got a couple quick ones. Uh, yeah. Station 113 has more calls in Sumner than Bonnie Lake. Is that because the AFA is in Northtown? Yeah, part of it is that. And it's also part, partly by the apparatus. So we have a tiller in Station 113, oh, okay. which is our ladder truck. And the ladder truck, it responds on a different variety of calls. It has our rescue equipment. It'll go on MBAs, uh, which are motor vehicle accidents on the freeway. Um, 
So today they had, you know, semi rollover. Oh, once it's yeah, that probably was... everyone, everyone's big news. Yeah. So that big piece of equipment will get dispatched there, even if it wasn't in their first due, just because it carries the equipment, the struts, okay. and the rest of the equipment. So it's kind of a jack of all trades. So the numbers may seem like they're they're going on more calls, but they're actually just kind of added to response. I don't on call volume. Um, what is the uh, increase at 112? Is that Pahale? No. Uh, 112 was the one in Prairie Ridge. And, yeah. Oh, so yeah, the increase is that they're, they're first due into, yeah. into Tahali right now. Okay. Yeah, the call comes in at Wesley, Wesley Homes in that area. They're the closest unit of it. Yeah, a 26% increase. That, that just seemed yeah. extraordinary yeah. for Yeah, for, but, for and uh, um, we're looking at a new piece of property for that station, which will kind of move them a little closer to that area, but it will put them out onto 120th corridor, and they'll have a little bit better access to kind of the prairie ridge just be be a little bit closer in and they'll support that 117 but the biggest thing they'll have that help will be 117 then it'll put an engine and and all your medic rigs have als yeah actually all of our engines we are now to the point now we have enough paramedics that we have a, a paramedic on all of our engines and our medic incredible you guys have any questions for steve all right, well, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right, uh, Chief Jeter with the Bonnie Lake Police Department monthly report. Right, another busy month for us. The uh, calls are down just slightly, but still uh, we're trending upward for the year. Of note, last time we were out going on to Mountain View Middle School, suspicious person. About that this month. Quite a few instances of failure to yield again. Officers are doing a great job of catching shoplifters when they uh, they try to flee, and, and when they do decide to be honest and stop, our officers are right there to get them. Had a burglary at the Highway Grocery. A neighbor heard some commotion at the Highway Grocery there in front of Teeter. Called in. Our officers were quick on the scene, located a couple people, reviewed the video, and. Uh, were able to identify one suspect for sure and recover the property. They couldn't get in. They only got their hands in a bunch of uh, cigarettes and things like that, but he had cut his hands up and still had it with him. The other one I'm sure you heard about was somebody tried to steal the ATM from the Chase Bank. Mm -hmm. And again, the officers <clears throat> got there so quickly that the uh, suspects fled and left the truck, stolen truck that they had just stolen from the view of vintage. Um, Still hooked up to the ATM, and it was in the middle of a flower bed. They uh, they fled, and we couldn't get a canine to respond. So uh, we haven't identified him, but no money we could establish was taken. Huge amount of damage to the ATM, ripping that out of the wall. And then uh, I don't know if it was a stolen vehicle, but referred it to our auto theft detective, and he will process to see if we get some fingerprints out of it, possibly. And just a hunch that this might not be the person's crime they've committed, so maybe their fingerprints will be identify them that way. As stupid as it was, it may be though. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, they, they clearly are... aren't good at it, but <laughs> do, those, do those have a GPS? What's the, that? The ATMs? I don't know if they do or yeah. do not. Yeah, I don't know. I was shocked at the amount. Of... Yeah. Luckily, they didn't get it. And then I will uh, lead you to the page. Sorry if there's tier marks on the stat page. Those are my tiers. Um, you'll see that they're just, it's off the charts. Burglary, for the first five months of 21, we had 14 issues. Thefts last year, we had 140. We're up to 287 this year. Here's the big one. Motor vehicle thefts, five, first five months of last year, two this year, 36. Um, destruction of property, vandalism at this time last year, we had 51. Uh, this year we've had 103. Our calls are up 39%. We're at 10,269 this year compared to 6,300 about this time last year. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a busy start to the year so far. I'm thankful also for the weather and for the 4th of July being on a I, I think that contributed to a little bit of sanity in the big city. We appreciate, 
I don't have the stats for that. We always run a month behind on our stats. So uh, we will get June's next month and we'll probably all have it for the 4th of July too. I don't believe we issued any citations for fireworks, but we did respond to calls setting off fireworks. I think everybody knows it's difficult to enforce because you have to see who one who lights them off. You see them go up in the air, that's the easy part, but determining who is the culprit, who do, who do cite, because as Dean will attest, you got to be able to identify them, which is frustrating, but uh, I know that they did shag a lot of calls. South Sound 911 wanted to make all fireworks complaints online only, and mm -hmm. I, for the city of Bonnie Lake, I opted out of that. I wanted all of our calls dispatched and responded to by officers. Just I think that that level of customer service, and I know a lot of people get frustrated by it, so I didn't want them to put something online, not have it responded to, or, or not feel that they were responded to. So we, as a city, opted out. I know Sumner opted in. I, I got a text from Councilmember Watson on 4th of July asking why we had opted out, so I explained to him customer service thing. Obviously, it's prioritized. If they got something of a higher priority going on, they're not going to respond to it, but they, they will get to it. I just think that that's important, that if our citizens are calling for police, that we should be there. I mean, it may not be in the time frame that they're wanting, but I do think it warrants a follow-up. If they take their time to call us, they should get a response. So that's the report. I have some items of interest if anybody has any questions on our monthly report. Uh, I do. Traffic violations charged? Uh, I'm going to question my Cooper man. Down about 50%? Yes. What's the uh, the reasoning for that? The, uh, the reasoning for that is there are fewer traffic stops happening. I think it's across the state because a little bit of frustration from the officers. They feel bad for pulling over the honest people and giving them tickets. So, and you will see though that our DUIs are off the charts. Last year at this time we had nine, this year we've had 22. So that's way up, but uh, traffic misdemeanors are down quite a bit and, and traffic activity overall is down quite a bit. We had uh, 508 traffic infractions at this time last year, 241 this year. Vehicle collisions are also up, so we're, we're noticing reckless behavior, aggressive behavior, and officers are trying to make a difference. But again, when they when they try to stop them and they don't stop, the officers are a little bit frustrated with that. And it's not just here, it's across the state where traffic numbers are down. Yeah, Auto Theft Task Force is funded by, I think there's $5 from every ticket goes to fund the Auto Theft Task Force. So you can imagine if the numbers are down across the state, the Auto Theft Task Force funding is that there's uh, times are being committed. And the other thing is, the officers are responding to 4,000 more calls this year. Yeah, they don't yeah, have the time so to make the traffic stops and, and do some of those things. So it's kind of a, a mixture of things. I know the officers are out there being busy and uh, trying to de deter mm -hmm. crime, and they, they haven't been able to do the traffic stuff as much as they'd like to. Some of it is if they do stop, uh, they they aren't issuing the tickets, they're issuing the Yeah, that's reasonable. So that's that's mm -hmm. kind of the it's a huge increase though. That's for sure. When, when did the new laws go into effect? Was that July, July of 21? Okay. And that's why you'll see our crime rate kind yeah. of took a trend upward after that. Yeah. Especially motor vehicle deaths. Yeah, because right now, I mean, it's, it's not apples to apples, and that's why I'd be curious what the first half of this year looks like compared to the last mm -hmm. half of that's last possible. year. Yeah. 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 Getting into that. All right. What else you got, sir? Um, while we're talking crime stats, I, and I will say that I got a sneak peek at the crime in Washington report. And uh, as much as it pains me to say this, we lead the county in 26%. Um, and others are similar, but we, we lead the pack. The one thing that I'm extremely proud of is the amount of arrests that we've made. We also lead Pierce County in that 27% arrest rate, which closest one to us is, I think it's due to good training, is Buckley. I think they're at 26%. And then uh, might be gosh, Roy or Rustin, they're at 24, and Puyallup and Gig Harbor are at 20. And then uh, not throwing any stones down the hill, but the city below us is 6%. So 
So um, <clears throat> one in four going to jail for all of this crime is, is not necessarily a good thing. I'd love to see it higher, but I, I am proud that, like I said, the officers are out there trying to make a difference. One in four were able to nab, and, and it's, it's about that on the thefts, do one out of every four that arrest. So is it saying that we're leading? Increasing. Okay, so then is it fair to say that as like some cities taken a stand? I think that's a lot of it yeah. because people because I feel report like it. Like really yeah. aggressively keep the city safe. And I and I think that you're right there that people do call and report things because they know it's going to be followed up. Yes. So I mean it's kind of so a double-edged sword that the customer yeah. service, but then again, having all these box stores oh, it yeah, really yeah. has contributed to the increase <laughs> yeah. of the shoplifting. And it just amazes me that I that we never hear from Lowe's. You can't tell me that they're having the same not having the same problem that we're. They don't so do they just, they just choose it. not to call us yeah. and let it happen. Yeah. yeah, Home Depot, and, and they've been good. They've got good uh, loss prevention folks there, and uh, we seem to be getting better cooperation from most of them, except for, like I said, Lowe's does a call, Fred Meyer tries, Target does a great job, Walmart does a great job, Home Depot does a pretty good job, Marshall's does not. Whole so far, I think we they were open a day, and we had our first drop lift from there. So, yeah, it's... Fortunately, last night we had a truck with a motorcycle in the back ran a, a stoplight in front of one of our officers, tried to pull him over in the Bonnie Lake Village parking lot right there where the uh, Prime Fitness is. Planet Fitness, mm -hmm. Planet Fitness <clears throat> is, took off from the officer. The, the motorbike fell out of the back of the truck as they were going around the complex. Motorbike was stolen. The truck was crashed back behind there, and the person fled into the woods, and the canine wouldn't come out because we didn't have probable cause for a specific person. We have probable cause for a crime, but not for a person because we didn't know who we Believe it or not, the truck was not stolen, but if it wasn't, my guess is it's in the process of being reported stolen <laughs> by whoever owns it so they can you know, push themselves back. That's just kind of... Uh, you gonna get him on an unsecured load? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. You make yeah. sure that happens. <laughs> and I, I was like, yes, you know, that there was a, a Walmart employee last night, too, had a little mini bike that was behind the Walmart stolen last night. The officers were able to recover it. They watched the video, saw who the suspects were, uh, located the suspects, again, over by Planet Fitness, and they had a U-Haul that was in the back of the U-Haul, and they got a confession and got the mini bike back. So, uh, again, officers being proactive, and investigating things like that. And that was about the same time that the other thing was going on where the motorcycle fell out of the back. So no, uh, no vehicles or anyone injured from the motorcycle hitting. The uh, actually, that the suspect vehicle deep trunk another car in front of the Jack in the Box with somebody in it, mm. and he was complaining of neck pain. It didn't sound like it was severe, but you can imagine that any rear ender yeah. you're going to have whiplash issues and other things like that. Hit him at a pretty trying to get away. Where'd the bike fall out at? Going around the corner by the Domino's fleet feet. Oh, okay. In, in the parking lot area there, it didn't make it on the floor zone? No. And no. Some, someone was smart enough to try and steal from Walmart with an officer there? Yeah. Yeah, good times. And then uh, on the hiring front, <laughs> we still have one vacancy. And as I talked about in the last couple of meetings, we've been kind of waiting to hire because uh, we've been dragging salary because the two people that retired had uh, a lot of vacation and sick leave. So we're trying to decrease the impact to the city because we can't budget for everybody that is eligible to retire. So we are in the process. We have two on the lateral list. And then on Friday, I believe, we're gonna do another oral board. We have a, another lateral candidate and what we call an exceptional entry candidate, somebody who doesn't have the two years that's required of a lateral. So we'll be doing that, and then hopefully, I'd like to have somebody on to fill that position. That way, we'll have about five months of salary savings, benefit savings to, to go towards that and help offset the budget a little bit. To do that, and that's if we get good candidates and they make it through the background. Somebody doesn't nab them first. Do you have any upcoming retirements? 
Yeah. Okay. Not not that I've been made aware of. Okay. There's there's few people that are eligible. But he has made their intent to. Uh, copy with the cop. We're bringing that back Thursday. First one is 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Second one is 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. over at Lamp Post Coffee. So we've been putting it on our social media. Hopefully, it's been a while. Before COVID, we had a really good turnout at the last one. Probably 20 or 30 people stopped by at the evening. Best we've had. Then again, we've been off now for two years. So getting that reestablished again. So, um, what, what were those hours again? 9 to 11 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. at Lamppost. And then that same night, I sent you all an email that our officers will be participating in a charity baseball game down in Sumner. A uh, group of, I believe that they have different levels of autism, but it's a group and they're, they're finding it hard to find anybody that wants to play them. So our somebody asked that the coach for that team is a Sumner sergeant. So he started inquiring if law enforcement would like to put together a team. And uh, so we have four of our officers that are gonna play in that. Uh, two of them are former college baseball players. Mm -hmm. We had to tell them this oh. is for fun. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is our, our newest officer. He's uh, six foot seven, oh. played baseball at the University of New Mexico. And when he graduated, he was throwing the ball 95 miles an hour. Oh. So I told him that this game, and, uh, but it should be fun. It should be a lot of fun. So I'm planning on going down. That's um, a start at six. Six o'clock at Summer High School. On which day? Field, yeah. Which day is it? Uh, uh, Thursday. Fourteen. Who are the four officers? It's Officer Graham, Officer Burnham, Detective Johnston. Oh, okay. And uh, National Night Out is, we won't have another meeting prior to that. It's the second Tuesday of August, which I wanna say, I'm sorry, first Tuesday, yes. Yeah. August 2nd, that's what threw me. August 2nd, the first Tuesday, thank you, um, at Allen York Park. And again, that's another one that we're not sure what the turnout's gonna be is we haven't had it in a couple of years, but we're, we're bringing that back. We've talked to uh, Joe Lovett, who is an employee who has a, a hot dog grilling business that we're gonna have him. Usually we, we had city employees do that. It's a little bit tough to recruit for that. So we're gonna have Joe do that. Walmart usually helps us out with donations. Lots of fun stuff for, for kids to do and kind of make it a family style event. And back into that, see how it goes. What's that one called? That's National, National Night Out. National, okay. And that's obviously a national event. So a lot of different agencies will be doing something it's, it's meant to get communities to rally together um, and kind of <coughs> combat crime. Is that 6 p.m. as well? That one is at, I want to say it's 4 p.m. Check on there. Okay. Anybody has any questions? Anyone? All right. Thank you so much. All right, we'll go to item number three, the emergency management monthly report. Regine. All right, thank you. So the first item is uh, when I started here, I inherited a, <clears throat> an in-process continuity of operations government, lovingly known as HoopTog. Um, it's one that we are writing jointly with our EPIC group, so East Pearson or local coalition. Um, so we, I finished the re our review of our plan for that. And it has gone back to the team. I actually had a meeting with them today about it. Um, and so we are just fixing a couple of formatting issues and then it will actually be ready for signing and distributing. It's not one that gets formally promulgated because it's just a working document, um, but really happy to see that finished. And so now we're creating a training and exercise plan for it so we can get everybody up to speed on what to do when something happens. We can continue our essential functions. Um, so. What is our continuity of government plan? I mean, on a high level. A uh, high level, the agreements that we found uh, that I think we should come back and revisit. So this is kind of finalized now, but I'd love to revisit it. Mm -hmm. Says that um, if for some reason we can't function at all as a city, the county would assist us with that. Okay. So um, I think we should probably come back to that uh, once we 
a chance to cycle back through and other points as well. Do we have, I, I know I asked about this before, but we didn't have anything in our code. What is, if, if the mayor resigns or passes away, what is, what's the, the line of secession there as far as that continuity? Yes, um, so I apologize because I don't have it right in front of me, but um, it does lay out mayor, deputy mayor, third one, correct? Where the, where the okay. council acts to appoint an interim mayor. Oh, okay. So, so there's it goes down the council three, yep. oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so it goes down three levels in the delegation. Of the okay. So uh, once I have the final document, I'll definitely share it with you all so that we can, it's a living document, so we can update it at any point in time if anything changes, um, but I'll make sure that everyone gets a copy of it as soon as we Does that become code at some point or is that this does separate? Not come, this does not create code, but okay. that is something that I would like to pursue with you all once we kind of get some of these things settled. Some of the delegations of authority were a little foggy to me when I was reviewing some so I'm wanting to revisit them and make sure that we've Codified everything that we need to, and that we're good. Should something happen? Yeah. So, uh, but glad to at least have working draft for the department. So, if, you know, they need to relocate, or the you know, power goes out, or something like that. They need. They know what they need That's to do. Great. Yes. Um, we are also doing our kickoff. Uh, we're holding kickoff meetings to start our comprehensive emergency management plan planning. So that CEMP, that's our that one plan I was explaining to you guys last month, it's the only plan we're legally required to have by the state. We are we will be holding a kickoff to begin planning for that. You'll see an invite coming. That. Um, the Bonnie Lake Alert System, so that's the Code Red program we were talking about last month. It's the new alert and warning system. Actually, is just getting ready to go live. We're at the point now where Sadie and I are updating the website so that folks can go on. And Chuck was extremely helpful in helping me create an internal staff um, list of everyone's work contact information. So we're uploading everybody into the system as well. Um, we're also we'll be creating identifying some groups that we can group our staff in there with because we can actually use it for internal call out purposes as well. So. We should be able to go live. I was hoping this week, but the budget process has been a little daunting <laughs> the last couple of weeks. So um, any day now, we'll be live with it. So you guys will be the first to know. Um, for the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, um, we had our first emergency management. That group of leaders that will advising me as I'm creating this emergency management program for the whole city and one of the first things that we did was to actually go through and clean up and restructure our our eoc organizational chart so we know all the staff that are on that chart are still with us um and uh added a few names for some folks that have joined us and and or have expressed interest in group um, and so we've also now held our first eoc team meeting so it was just really our first getting them all in there, getting to know each other, establishing some processes. That EOC team will be at least now through December to start training and exercising how to function in that EOC environment when something happens. So they'll be getting a variety of training. Um, we'll be focusing on some incident command um, system stuff, ICS, but also just how to set the room up, <laughs> how to collect, connect to the network, um, how to organize into the system, how to fill out forms, how to send stuff to the county if they need to, some of that basic stuff that they haven't had to do. So um, we're getting moving. And so uh, every month, one hour, except for two of those months would be two hours. So we didn't have to. Um, do you have any elected officials on that team? So I was actually <laughs> head into that. So oh, okay. part of that. So part of that org chart cleanup, there is a policy group that should be established. And so that policy group, would be made up of the council, would be made up of or would be part of that as well. Um, and so we are, I, we, when I say we, I mean the EPIC group, we're actually working collectively at creating some training for that policy group and also bringing in, I haven't taken it, it's ICS 402. Elected officials or executives 
Um, and so we'll be bringing that as well. So we can get you all trained for the EOC and then for the whole ICS system. That will be coming. Um, and then I would I say, a, I yes, a question. Um, so recently at the AWC conference, we mm -hmm. were talking about um, the public information officer and how they would communicate emergencies to the public. And um, there was just a lot of, we were talking with a lawyer who um, was explaining to us some of the, some of the issues and how to communicate properly to the public so that they can still trust, you know, yes. that we're doing what's best for them and trying to get information out to them. Is, is there a plan in place for that as far as how, I see that there are people that are going to be delegated um, for that, mm -hmm. um, but is there a plan in place as to how those communications are, are going to be fed to people and how it's going to be communicated? That's a great question. So a couple of those individuals are very well trained public information. Okay. And a couple are new. Okay. And so um, part of the first strategy is making sure that they've actually all taken public information. Okay, gotcha. Because they, a couple of them do need that. Okay. Um, Second, some of that information going out would go out through our Bonnie Lake Alert system, right? Okay, which is getting up and running. So part of this will be a really good marketing strategy to get folks to register for that, right. so we can actually share those messages. Okay, um, and then also social media. Okay, so we would be using that as well. Um, at the same time, um, I think we discussed it last month, and I don't think you were with us, but. Um, on the website that we're creating, mm -hmm. where folks will go to register for yeah. this, there's actually a widget we'll plug in that will show the last five alerts. Okay. So if for some reason they missed something or they have a question about what was that area or was I supposed to evacuate, they can go there and see it. Okay. So there are a few things we're putting in place. Um, when it becomes a larger incident where it's not just Bonnie Lake mm -hmm. involved or something like that, mm -hmm. um, there is an East Pierce group of public information officers that work together and it's all sorts of, um, not just our EPIC team, but also like representatives from the fire de departments and um, school districts and so forth that work together in what's called a JIC or a GIS, mm -hmm. Joint Information Center okay. or System, so that they can coordinate that messaging. Okay. Um, and then if it gets even larger, then it would be a countywide, county would, op would open their board. Okay, I yeah. think, I think I guess one of my uh, concerns, which I'm sure that they, you know, talk about this in PIO training is mm -hmm. just um, when there is an incident that happens and, and as a city, we're unaware of what, what is the issue. Let's say there's a, a large explosion and nobody knows what that is. Um, just, is there a plan in place where we are still first to get information out to the public, whether that's we don't know anything that we're investigating further, or do we just remain silent until we have all the information, I guess was my concern. So, yep, no, that's a, that's a great point as well. So to me, that's something that we need to address in our city. Okay. And that's, there is actually a communications plan component okay. that goes in that plan. Um, and currently our CEMP is 22 years old. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna say probably not. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but it is something that we plan to do in our updated CEMP. Okay. So I hope that helps. Send out yeah. MySpace alert. Town <laughs> 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 crier. Yeah. Yeah. Town crier. Oh, 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 my God. God. Yeah. <laughs> team had a chance to meet with the new executive director and operations chief um, for the American Red Cross over our chapter. We had a really great meeting with them, um, really getting to understand oh, okay. their capabilities um, and resources because yeah. just like the rest of us, they do have limitations. And so when it comes to being able to um, shelter the public or open up a warming center or a cooling center, what really are their capabilities? And the reality is that a lot of us have depended on them for a long time, and it takes them just as long to get going as it takes us, sometimes longer because they rely on volunteers. And so it really um, solidified for us that we need to be able to, to uh, at least provide that immediate, you know, if we need to do a, okay, you need to leave this area, 
have capabilities ourselves to be able to send individuals to a place and at least take care of them for a little while until the Red Cross can help or as long as we need if they can't help. So um, it was a very good meeting. Uh, one of the things that we did get out of it is that we are going to get some free cots from them. So <laughs> um, that's great because we currently don't have any sheltering supplies. So um, great meeting, really great new relationship um, and really excited to move forward with them. We also um, actually just today held our first stakeholder meeting to share the new um, updated East Pierce Lahar Rapid Action Plan. So that was finalized a few months ago, if you remember. And as soon as we released it, we had, I think, four different fire departments and a couple of other first responder agencies come back to us and say, okay, don't hate me. We have one change we need to make, or we have these changes we need to make. And so we quick made those changes for them. It's now version 2.0, um, and it has been re-released back to the stakeholders. So today we gave that, that presentation to the stakeholders involved. Um, in the direct response uh, to a Lahar incident. So um, there will be one more, I think it's Thursday on my calendar. Um, and then again, the EPIC team, I mentioned we're bringing training to the region. So I mentioned that first um, earlier about the ICS 402, but we're also looking to bring quite a few other trainings to this area um, because our EOC team and just our staff in general really have a lack of training when it comes to ICS. So we want to make sure that the individuals that need that training um, that will be part of for the emergency operations center response can get what they need. So um, a lot of times I, I think um, both chiefs will nod their heads at me. You know, two of the required trainings for all of our staff is ICS 300 and 400. You can't ever get them. Um, they're always full or, you know, they're not available for whatever reason. So we're actually going to be hosting our own. Um, so we're, we're done waiting for everybody else. <laughs> so um, that's kind of what we're wor working on right now is getting those trainings here. And then once we can, then we'll get more into the positions. I think that's as much as, I mean, you could read the rest of it. There's some fun <laughs> stuff in there, but There's a ton, those yeah. are the highlights. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. We will now go to item number four, prosecutor's office monthly report. This is a new thing, right? Yes. Awesome. I um, copied um, Regine, who copied the, the police chief and the fire chief. <laughs> so <laughs> copying is the highest form of flattery. <laughs> it is. All right. Um, so this is the first time I'm doing it. So if anybody has any comments on information they'd like included in the future, um, please let me know. At uh, the beginning, I have the number of hearings we've had. So arraignments would be like an initial hearing. That's their first time of hearing in court. Um, Pre-trial hearing would be after the arraignment. Um, that's a hearing kind of to check on the case status. And then you have um, sentencing hearings and review hearings. Those are after they've already pled guilty due to some changes in uh, victim rights law. We're going to be having a lot more times where it's bifurcated and the person's pleading guilty. And then the sentencing hearings being set over to ensure the victim has the right, um, the ability to exercise their right to be present at sentencing. And then review hearings are the, the checkup on what they're supposed to be doing in terms of classes attending and staying out of trouble. Um, we also have uh, community court compliance hearings. Uh, we had 27 of those. Those are checking in on the community court people, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the community court pre-opt are people who haven't officially opted in, but they're kind of on the track. They still have to do a meeting. Um, with the community court um, liaison person to make sure they've done their evaluation in it. Um, in terms of body-worn camera, uh, we've been working a lot on that to make sure that we um, know how to provide it to defense. Um, there's actually under the court discovery rules, we just can't send them the evidence.com link. Defense attorneys have to consent to electronic discovery. Uh, so we've been working to send out agreements to all of the defense attorneys who regularly appear in our court to have them sign up and agree wow. that they're okay with that. 
Um, we haven't gotten any of those back yet. And actually the main public defender has said she's not able to receive electronic discovery and wants a couple more months to set it up. You can't click on the link? She, she says it takes too long to download. Um, and she has some internet issues. Um, so, uh, so in the meantime, we're having to either download to a CD or download to a USB to provide to her and to defense attorney. And these are really <clears throat> large files because depending on the length of the incident and how many officers response, responded. So like for a DUI, you might have multiple officers and if it's a yeah. hospital blood draw, mm -hmm. you know, this can take a couple hours with a couple different officers and every angle has to be provided right. to defense. Um, so it's, it's a process. Um, we've also met with um, Seattle and Puyallup to find out just what their lessons learned in the stand up of their body worn camera program was in terms of what they did with staff and software and discovery logistics with the defense community. Um, and then um, Josh and Kristen, they attended a tra training with the um, City of Seattle video specialist. Se City of Seattle has, I believe, at least two video specialists on staff that they hired specifically due to the body worn camera program. Um, so they had a training that he conducted just to learn more about the evidence.com um, software. And that was uh, AC Boyle put that together. Um, and then in terms of there's two court decisions that came out that are um, impacting us. One was um, state v. sum. That basically held that under the state constitution that the race of the defendant is a part of the totality of the circumstances to be considered on whether or not basically the person was seized. In other words, believe they weren't able to leave a social encounter with a police officer. Um, so that could cause more motion hearings for us as defense attorneys bring that issue up in motion hearings. And then there was a Kitsap County case that technically speaking here only has persuasive authority in Pierce County. Um, it's not binding, but there was a issue about the Drager um, breathalyzer and tr uh, truncating versus rounding. It basically was the state toxicologist was not in compliance with the WAC. And um, the court used some really um, very critical language of the state toxicologist and how truthful they were about their compliance. So basically at this point, um, we're prosecuting, um, you know, blood results are always good. And then also we can always prosecute under the affected by. So even without, you know, totally speaking, a person can still be committing a DUI just by being affected by the intoxicant without the breathalyzer result. Yeah. A lot of officers just talk for a blood yeah. draw instead of even messing with a drager. And that's how a lot of jurisdictions are doing it. And that's, that's the word of the blood draw is all done at the hospital? Yeah, same as <clears throat> Is that a multi-care procedural thing versus? I think so, yeah. yeah. We do have, there are law enforcement officers that are trained as phlebotomists. They will do it. I know we talked to the fire department, they, we would be able to use their, their blood pressure room. But if there's one on duty, we can call a phlebotomist up to and do it. But most of them are on the west side of the county. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's the best thing that we can do. I'm assuming when you take somebody in to get blood drawn. I mean, in, term, in terms of officer time, the blood yeah, draw is a big <laughs> sink all of time. Yeah. <laughs> I've never yeah. seen a bill for it. Yeah, I, ha I don't think oh. I have either. I think it would go up in terms of there is a um, DUI cost that the defendant, when they are found guilty, has to pay. And it talks about the number of hours the officer okay. was on the case. Gotcha. You know, And so that could go up. And in theory, if the defendant Days, then they they're, will be covering their They're costs. reimbursing the city for okay. that. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I thought thank this was going to be a, a relatively brief <laughs> yeah, meeting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll slide in now to business and action items. Uh, AB 2294, Ordinance B 2294, amending the Bonnie Lake Municipal Code. Uh, repealing Bonnie Lake Municipal Code Chapter 9.12 due to the passage of the uh, Engrossed Substitute House Bill 1630. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I am just the messenger on this, so this is something that the state <laughs> legislature did. Yeah. So based on absolutely. <laughs> yes. So based on feedback I got after a few weeks ago, um, I changed uh, the proposal to be that we're not um, basically um, adopting the RCW. Uh, we are, there is a proposed sign language um, that basically says that no weapons are allowed per RCW 9.41. And then added to that based on uh, feedback I got would be a QR code that people could scan because telling speaking, um, if a person has the license to conceal and carry, it can, they can bring a firearm into the council chamber. So there will be a QR code where if a person wants to get information about that, they can scan it with their phone and get a link to the Department of License website. And then the only other change to the code um, would be removing the prior language regarding weapons in the council chamber, just because the RCW would now basically, um, because there's a bunch of other weapons that are not allowed, like knives and nunchucks and stuff. Um, so just ours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so just just, ours. it would just be removing the language from the code, having the RCW would take precedence. And then um, there was some language regarding weapons um, when the council chambers is, would be in its as a courtroom and that was just being changed to mirror the way the RCW um, phrased the exceptions like for law enforcement and military. Yeah, oh, I hope we're all in the same agreement that in that case even conceal or open, it is, yeah. is excluded from courtroom. Right. It right. is, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I read through yeah. 1630 and mm -hmm. it, it, it okay. yeah. And, and, as a, when I was growing up, one of my friends, his father was a judge, and they had a guy come in and shoot at him several times. So it was nice to make sure we have that ex or that inclusion in there that no guns are allowed at that time. Um, so I just I was wondering if because um, this is basically just changing the ordinance to comply with the RCWs, you know, right? Correct. Um, so what I was wondering is if this could be kind of taken off of our hands altogether, remove the ordinance, and then all of the signs posted will be like as per RCW, uh, so that we don't have to vote anytime the um, state decides to make changes, which we know is going to come down. There's always going to be new, more changes as far as Know, conceal carry versus open carry everything else and this is going to be a constant change so if we just change the rcws have the, an ordinance at all can my, we kind of delete the ordinance? my opposition to that is we're giving our power to the state mm -hmm. where we can still maybe not in this instance but by keeping our own rcw we can modify this as necessary as needed within the guidelines of what the state does and either make it more or less depending on what the way the legislature goes or, or allows over time. I think we can make it more restrictive, but we can't make it less restrictive. No, I get that. But I mean I don't want to I don't want to turn yeah. over an entire section of our code to the mm -hmm. state control and because if the state somehow does say something that does get brought in but is still coming before a superior court, mm -hmm. at, at what point are we now, you know, oh, but it's it's what the state says versus what mm -hmm. we say, you know, in line with the state. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but I would prefer to keep our keep it as it as it's written here. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't like to give any more power to the state than. Yeah, I understand that, but also I also understand what my oath was, and um, I I don't want to sign anything. That is going to restrict God-given no rights on it. of the people. Yeah, you can right? certainly still so vote no on it. But I'm just saying, if I can, if I could take well, it off you know, of my hands. I think you'd argue that God gave us those rights, but I think <laughs> they are rights given to they us. They are God-given rights protected by the Constitution. <laughs> well, they weren't. Uh, on, they weren't on the Ten Commandments, so, so. that's why I would <laughs> argue the the duality of. Uh, of that, but uh, that's a different that's a different meeting. So, how are you guys? I mean, this is on tonight's agenda. It's yeah. not on the consent agenda, but it is okay. on the agenda to be discussed. So, okay. are we okay with moving it forward as that, or do we have to strike it from the agenda tonight? No, I think we. Um, I, I know council wants to. 
about it. So. Yeah. Um, as you, I'm not comfortable with these. I'm just taking. Even. So, um, I, I don't want, um, as far as this is concerned, I know that if it were ever to the, um, the state then attempting to restrict more of people's constitutional rights, then I just, I can't, I can't be supportive of that. Um, and I wouldn't. Um, even if it meant that there was, there would be questions uh, to us as a city. I know that that was the biggest concern, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, the liability that exactly. we would. Exactly, yes, this decision. But I think there's, there would be liability regardless, even if. Okay, well, next is this, you know, and, and I, I do yeah. kind of feel like that's what the state is doing, mm -hmm. is they are, they are slowly picking off this, and, and you know, I'm yeah. preaching to the yeah. car right now, yeah. but. You know, they're just slowly picking off this, then it's this, then it's this. And so I guess my just question then becomes. So um, I, with hesitation um, and definitely a, not a fan of this, and I, and I want to stress to you, I know you're the most. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I am not comfortable with this, but um, the way that it, that it is currently written, With he with great hesitation. Well, me personally, I I don't want to send anything to the full council that's not going to get a full support. You know, six to one, whatever the case may be. But yeah, I mean, if this is just going to be under contention again, I, I don't know what we can't let it leave here without the three of us being in agreement of what this needs to be before we send it to the council. Because right now we're a split vote, and that's not what I want to present coming out of this committee. I mean, I, so what you're saying you know, is you were nine, telling me like, you know, a couple last week or whenever it was two weeks ago when we were discussing this, you're like, well, it's just it only affects your your open carry. It doesn't affect. But I read through this and it absolutely does affect concealed carry, because if you knowingly walk into um, a gun free zone or open carry in a gun-free zone or in any of these public meetings that they've added to the um, the list of you can't do this, um, then they can take away your concealed carry license for up to three years. Well, and so that, in that which, definitely which regard, affects, which meetings are you talking you know, about? I, I know what she's talking about. It, it is, it is stated the in meetings. there that yeah. if you attend a meeting and openly open carrying but you have a concealed weapons permit mm -hmm. then your concealed weapons permit can be if yeah. you if you come into somewhere open carrying right um, yeah. even though you have a concealed so but i think um gwendolyn i can with confidence tell you that um this this is not affecting people who are concealed and they are going and concealing their weapon that does not affect those people and i i know that there was a lot of um uh, there was a there was a a lot of heated discussion up at the legislature in regard, but I know that there were some fighting for um, that not because this wouldn't I mean no matter what we do it doesn't affect school boards even school boards within our city mm -hmm. boundaries so mm -hmm. I mean that's not that's not a, an issue I mean we're yeah. really talking commission meetings. Uh, these meetings here, work, mm -hmm. workshops and council meetings with that. Correct. With, I mean, with the exception of any special meeting that we might have for any particular reason. Right. That's, that's really what we're, we're discussing here. Arguably, the RCWs enforce here whether or not council votes for it. I mean, at this point, council's just voting for whether to change the code and whether or not to become put, compliant. Put, yeah. yeah, to put signs up. Yeah. The state legislature basically passed the RCW and now the law here. Yeah. Right. So without doing something, 
God forbid something does happen, that's where the liability comes in is because it, we're out of our code is out of compliance with what the RCW. Right, it's the the, la the lack of signs, and then um, you know, in, in case something happens, and then the potential if the state AG, if, you know, they could come and they can not make our lives pleasant. Yeah, but I don't want to strictly use that as a means of. Enforcement. I want to make sure this is something that's right. I don't care what the AG does. They <laughs> AG sues cops that do their damn job. So who cares what the AG says? Is there any way that we can <clears throat> sue the state? I don't want to rock any boats here either. So I think I mean, the, the best thing to do is. I, I mean, if they were coming out and saying conceal carry, this is what we're going to. They are very unpredictable there. Yeah, I mean, they get away with this and then these changes, and then they're just going to inch away and inch away and just start pick, pick, pick. You give them an inch and they take a mile. They're, they're the same as us, though. They're elected officials that were put there by the people that they represent. So, I mean, you criticize what they do. They, it's the same as criticizing what we do. We just do it on a different scale. So. Mm -hmm. So, where are we at? Okay. One, one. We're kicking back to virtually what you want is 9.2 says RCRCW this. Yep. Essentially, I mean, I, I, if, if we change an ordinance, then this is something that I'm putting my signature on. And that's affecting the Second Amendment, regardless of whether it's just a concealed carry or just an open carry or whatever it is. You know, it was just a mask. It was just two weeks to stop the spread. And look where we're at two and a half years later. Now we're going to go, it's just open carry. You know, it's just, it's, it's. It's it's just part of. But we don't get any say in that at this level. We can adopt what the state yeah. says in our code, because that's we're not we're not this debating. Yeah, I, the actual act. I mean, that's said and done. I mean, I understand it's the law now, but I just I feel like there's got to be something that we can do to, you know, at least push back. Right. But I'm big. Just watching rights be stripped away from people, and I'm not okay with it. Well, and we're not debating the rights being stripped away. That's already that's already in stone. What we're discussing is, do we adopt this to match what the state says? That's really what it comes okay, down to. Okay, so what are the actual differences in the way our ordinance is written Right now, I mean, I've, I've been versus looking through this versus what are the changes? So, like, I mean, are these like big changes? We have like everything's underlined here is, you know, so the, the, so. the main thing we're doing is we're taking out the part of our code that says you're not allowed that laid out the weapons you weren't allowed to bring in and we're just mm -hmm. completely removed. Um, and I mean, and then um, just letting the RCW the enforced. We're not even really refer we're not even referencing the RCW code. And then the only other change that was being made was um, making the exceptions to the weapons mirror the same ex the language in the new the new RCW. Which was Correct me if I'm wrong, but if we for a technically go by how it is currently written, not of being adopted, we're not even allowed to have guns in our courtroom. The way that it's worded. The way it's in worded the in chambers. the council chambers. Right. They're all supposed to be turned into the clerk. These are really great. Language, by the way. <laughs> so we can keep it as like is, and then we it's have to, more. by law, by code, turn in all of our weapons. And right now, we can't even conceal carry based on how our code is yeah, I think written it, I because think... we have to turn everything over to Sadie. Right. And I don't know if we really want weapons check no, language. No, certainly our, not. To, to but I'm, I'm certainly not. But yeah. what I'm saying is, without adopting this, yeah, I mean, we can enforce something that's even more stringent than what the state is allowing because that's what our code says. Our code says right now we have to have a weapons check. 
Okay, so we can take that out then? That is being taken out. Okay. This is the sign that 37 yeah. is serving. It's different than the signs right now. This mm -hmm. this tells actually a little more, a little more clear. Okay. And we wanted to put, we, she and I talked off and wanted to put the QR code on there. <laughs> I mean, I think sure. that's probably as, um, as close as you can get to a pushback to the yeah. state legislature with I, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, we thank do. you. Yes. Thank you for listening. <laughs> okay, well, if we're going to make it a little bit less stringent than or strict than what it was before, then I can, I can, but if. So we're okay moving forward with this, the full council discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much. Go on to AB 22-100, resolution 3064, authorizing out-of-state travel. Chief Jeter. Yes, thank you. This would be urgent home to travel to a conference. Training is budgeted, but we did not include it in the budget. So therefore it has to be approved by the council. This would come out of our drug fund. So we're, uh, through uh, our narcotic seizures to send somebody train how to get them, <laughs> you know, to use it I to like it. counteract them, <laughs> even though it's not illegal. The distribution, this is a, a very valuable conference and you gotta travel down there and bring back anything you learn. Looks like a good investment. Try to combat this and, and he just happened to find one in southern california near san diego <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i know how much they, he enjoys the yeah, sun <laughs> i have no problem with that um that's not on tonight's consent or anything right no okay are you guys okay moving that to the consent yes okay mm -hmm. all right consent agenda for the next council meeting and then uh, approval of minutes anyone have any changes or discussions on that Right, so we'll move that as approved. And open discussion, Chief Jeter, update on the status of Allen York parking. Well, I think we heard about it last week, council meeting from this gentleman here that uh, I would imagine today it's probably filled into your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know it's, it's painful right now for this gentleman and the other lady that was here, but can you imagine if we would have kicked out 80 spots where we wanted to park the boat trailers 80 times more? Again, it's on days like today that this happens, especially on the week. Here's county security. They had a security guard quit. We're down to one security officer, and he's trying to watch both ends. We got people sneaking in. Our officers are trying to be there as much as they can, but parking continues to be a problem because there is no in the area for the amount of guys now. Correct. Yes, it's, you're having trailers. trailers. There are boat trailers there. Have, have you called them in? That A63221. I'll give you another one. All, where, I, where you all, call, I, ever, all I ever get is. You, you have, do you push the thing that says report a crime not in progress? Because that should, that should the, give you to dispatch. The deputy, uh, Our officers have not been reporting any trailers, but they're yeah. dealing with the park proper so, because all the issues at the park, right. so they probably aren't getting out that far. Yesterday, the without permits, oh. I lost both of them back up. It was what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better hit that ramp real fast. 
Yeah, it, it, it has been a challenge and the officers, like I said, that will have four on duty. They're spending a lot of their time down there. So the rest of the area. Services is part-time thing, so we try to have that out there Thursday through Sunday. On the weekends, we have kind of a noon to four and then a four to eight. Try to make sure we got additional coverage out there, but it, it's a challenge. I mean, boat trailer parking and that adds to it. I know that the boat parking isn't that we're not. This is the first I've heard of it, so I'll make sure I talk to our officers that are working it out there in their impound them. I know the officers have impounded probably a dozen cars since uh, we started getting the nice weather. A lot of them were parked in the boat trailer queue up parking along uh, mm -hmm. Bonnie Lake Boulevard mm -hmm. there. That's where the bulk of them, but they've been going on their PA. They've been going walking through the, the beach telling people to park here. You're going to get towed. Try to give people warnings so they can move it. And uh, like I said, we've had about 12 that have not heeded those warnings. Did some so, people leave as a result of the? Um, it, it's hard to tell. Right, because there's yeah. so many people. Right, okay. but we some people, some cars were moved, so there was some effectiveness to it. But mm -hmm. I mean, those people that were parked there could have been out on a boat too. Mm -hmm. They could have had somebody launch a county park and yeah. pick them up there and they oh. park illegally. I guess they can't see those big signs. I have a question and I, and I don't know if this is a solution or not. President is, you know, I did explain to them that we have attempted to exhaust possibilities um, and so that we are going so one of the um, frustrations that was um, being brought up is um, just the difficulty of the, the lock system. And so um, the lock system apparently is, is not very easy to handle. And so people are leaving it unlocked. Um, and so obviously if they're leaving it unlocked, you know, people are just, you know, going and doing whatever there. Um, but it is also frustrating for the people that are um, abiding by our guidelines for the park you know, buying, you know, the, the code or whatever for their permit and then um, having a difficult time with the lock. And so um, it was suggested, and again, I don't, I don't know if this is a solution, but, um, you know, in those kinds of situations where you have a boat, you have a trailer, you're very strong, get your boat in there. Um, I just wonder if there's um, a way that we can have um, a card system somehow, you know, like when you're at a hotel and you're, you know, placing it, um, to open a parking garage, for example. I, that's probably very expensive. We have that. It's okay. a bollard system, but it doesn't work. Oh, that's, that's it. It impaled a jet ski, evidently, the last time we used it. So that was what we would like to do, is, okay. is we wanted to do that. And uh, it works if you do it manually. So I, okay. I suppose you could have somebody there Is it a fine? It is it finances as far as well, being able to repair it? That, that would be a of? question for public works. I'm not sure because okay. I don't deal with that. Okay. It's a, a public works question. I don't know if John knows anything about it. I know okay. that Brian and I went out and looked at it because that's what we I thought mean, it, too. It, it was uh, 15 years mm -hmm. probably ago when it was originally put in. Okay. Um, it, it has sensor loops in both in the downslope as yeah. well as anything that can that that water can infiltrate and the downslope is constantly getting wet. Yes. You know those wires, right? They don't they don't last forever. Okay. Um, in the in the case of something like a jet ski, if it's like a fiberglass frame, yes, and it's a jet ski, there's no metal for it to detect that there's something there. So uh, the system says, okay, well after X amount of time and it doesn't find <laughs> anything there, up comes the ballard, and that was that case. Uh, okay. Um, so we had a number throughout the years of use that it was problematic just because. That boat launch is problematic. Just, I mean, location. Yeah, the design of it is. The design is, yes, is difficult. Yes. It, it's meant for a small, you know, 4,000 population, not right. a 25,000 <laughs> right. thousand population city. Okay. A fishing boat on a Ranger, not a, yes. mm -hmm. not yeah. a ski boat on a F-350. Um, but yes, we did have a, you know, basically a, a card mm -hmm. access system. It was in place probably for five or six years. And the cost to try and maintain that including having to dig out the loops and redo those loops. I mean, it, it was cost prohibitive to the point where, you know, it, the fees that we were charging even, didn't pay for it didn't pay for itself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, another suggestion that was made um, was uh, the, the issues it sounds like, other than just boat trailers, is just 
people are um, parking, but they're actually not, I'm not just talking about just right at Allen Yard, but you know, they're kind of infiltrating into the. Um, and so um, it sounds like there are no signs in those particular areas um, that say no parking, for example. And so I don't know if there's a possibility where we can then put, put things out there so that enforcement is a little bit easier when we're attempting to impound um, cars. And I also wonder too, it was also suggested that what if there's just, um, I don't know if there are other, um, you know, towing companies or there's multiple towing companies. Okay. Um, because I, I wonder if there's like a large amount of, if, if I'm just trying to think of myself going somewhere, for some reason I don't want to follow park somewhere, um, and then my car gets towed immediately. I, I feel like I would take those. I don't know, but I don't know. I think that takes a lot of manpower. But is, I, I wonder if there's like a heavy, you know, two a, weeks of that. Is it illegal to park on the street there? No, it would have to be by ordinance because yeah. you can legally park on the street yeah. in the area, and that's what's causing the problem. And a lot of people, um, I mean, you can find it in any neighborhood. In my neighborhood, yeah. I have cars to park on each side of the road, and it's tough to get a fire yeah, truck down between, there. Yeah. And I mean, I attest to that. That's every neighborhood. And the same thing's happening over there. Is they're parked legally, but it's tough to get first yeah. responders right. there. Okay. Um, and then again, if, if you make it illegal to park there, it pushes the problem farther out. We're finding that people all, all people are parked down by Emerald Hills and still mm -hmm. try to get there. They're moving into the neighborhood a little bit farther to the southeast, that newer neighborhood. I can't remember the name of the development, but they're parking all along there where there's that big field on mm -hmm. Church Lake Drive and West Taps, mm -hmm. right on the corner there. Mm -hmm. They're parking along that road in a fairly good split. They're parking over there. Yeah, can you have ones that those people attached to trailers? Take that geographic area. And, and the problem, that's a great idea, but the problem is by the time, that's not going to help this year. It, it's, and hopefully yeah. we'll have Next a solution. Next year won't be the issue. Yeah, yeah we'll hopefully the we'll issue. have the problem solved, but it doesn't really do anything for this year. Even after you have one. If, if we have adequate parking, we won't need to probably not a bad idea but it's, it's not something that's going to help immediately yeah. neither is a no parking if you do the no parking by the time you get it to the uh august public safety meeting and um, then if we put it on the consent right, agenda that of night the season, um, you know possible. the bulk of the yeah. season's over i mean so, can you can you really re are are these neighborhoods considered public streets though so yeah, can you really restrict whether people can park on you, a public you, you street. You can by or... ordinance because you've done okay. it by the high school and, yeah. and mm -hmm. in other areas. But again, then you would you would be restricting it mm -hmm. on a public road. So that's that's a discussion that you guys would have yeah. to have. And then with that is the expectation of enforcement. Well, and it would also restrict, yeah, I guess it would be very touchy because the residents that yeah. are actually parking there. And I think on 190, 194th, isn't that where you live on one? Is that there? There aren't a lot of people, a lot of residents to park on one because it is pretty much, uh, you know, uh, not an arterial, but it's it's a main road. There are okay. not a lot of driveways like in, in my neighborhood and Justin's neighborhood. People park on the street, but it's it's not like 194th where yeah, uh, they have driveways that go off there. Oh, not, okay. The residents don't typically park there that I've seen. Okay, but there. Are. Can't get there. Oh, parking yeah. 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 I don't see how that's legal to park there.
is there a way that we can fix the the locking mechanism? At, We've talked okay, to public get works about that lock. too. They thought it'd be okay. there's got to be an easy way. They said, well, you just got to really push on it. I'm like. Yeah, that's, I feel like people are already smelling like the toilet, the you got to jiggle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's why I said, I go, is there an easy I mean, it, we could hire somebody to sit there and help them, but finding somebody that is. You can work, do that. You just have a gatekeeper then at that point. Right. And but. They used to have. Yeah, that's how one of our public works folks right. got his start with the city is he took the launch money and was. Current. We tried to do that last year, have one stationed at the launch and one at the parking, make sure when people were coming in that they had their stickers and that they would have any help launching, couldn't find seasonal work. Part of the issue too, and when I say we, it's public works, it's not the police. But, uh, but if in a perfect world, that would be great if we had seasonal that could work there and be the gatekeeper with this. Looked at Pierce County Security, <clears throat> that's $40 an hour. And so we were looking at a temporary solution to, to have somebody there and, and 40 bucks an hour, 300 and a And then what do you do when they go home? People are probably still going to try to launch boats. Well, it, it sounds like the security personnel, because they're not police officers, and you know, they don't listen to security officers. No. And so like you said, they're, they're sneaking in around the sides and they, they certainly aren't looking at the signs. I guess they don't care about it being found it. For their enjoyment, I, I don't get the allure of spending time with 400 of my closest friends like this in a park. But it obviously appeals to a lot of people, especially on days like today. And, it, and this is a three month problem every year. And until we get a parks consultant, to look, and I've been asking for that every year since I've been back, to look at and give us real solutions. I mean, I'm not an expert on parks. I, I can talk about safety, but I mean, a parks consultant could tell you, look at Alan York and say, I think this amount of people is safe. There are no crowd limits like there is for buildings, so there's no capacity, but I think there needs to be one because free-for-all is not the answer website yes we've limited it to 300 people but like i said they're going around the security yeah, they're going over the fence uh, you know that's that's more of a guideline we don't we, we try to keep it at that but it's it's not and especially a, a day like today that's not really reasonable website Was that, was that specifically for COVID? It, it okay. started out as COVID, okay. but we've been a proponent of trying to cap it. Like County Park caps it when all the parking spots are full. They can shut it off. We don't have that luxury. Yeah. So that's yeah, what we, we had to come up with a number with and look at the, the real estate. Again, we, we took a stab at it. Parks consultant could tell us that. A parks consultant could look at parking and tell you how many parking spots you need so we're not impacting the surrounding neighborhoods. How many yeah. boat trailer parkings and look at all that. We're just trying to, to spitball here. And again, we're impacting people that live in the neighborhoods. We're impacting law enforcement by having to spend time out there. Public works is having to spend time out there. The whole thing needs to be looked at and we need to have a firm plan. But every year it's like, oh, we'll take care of this in the off season. And it never happens. It never gets budgeted for and then it's never happened. So that, we, we need to have a plan going forward on what we're going to do next year. It needs to be firm, and we need to start on it now so it's ready by next voting season. So we're not back next July with frustrated citizens in here about how this is impacting them. Because again, I, I don't imagine you have any problems in March parking on your roadway. <laughs> it's, it's if we have a nice May and June through you know, early September, and it seems to get worse when the kids get out of school, obviously, because the parents are heading to the park and trying to get some swim time for their kids. And, We've got a great park, but security continues to be an issue down there. And what we've suggested is capacity limits, voluntary bag checks, and active patrols by Pierce County. If they see any violations, to call us and we'll come in and take care of it. So we've had really good luck. We had the first year here was a free for all, and we were having 
six to 800 people in there. We were having gang fights. We took guns off people every, every week. And uh, it has, even though it's still a challenge, it's way better than it was two, three years. When you say Pierce County doing voluntary patrols, you mean Pierce County security? Security, okay, yes. yeah. yeah. So that, okay. the idea is to have two. One that <clears throat> monitors the gate, does voluntary bag checks. The other one that does walk through patrols and monitors the kayak in, because that's where they're, most of them are coming through. Or they'll say, oh, I'm renting a kayak. And they're okay, and they let them in, and they have no way of verifying because they got to go down and rent their kayak. Okay. So it's not a foolproof system. I, I know they do the best they can with what they got. But I would guess that the, the capacity is probably closer to four, upwards of four hundred. Anyone else for open discussion in the next couple minutes before we got to swap out? All right. Well, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.